Today's message is going to be on high-tech grace believers. Now, last week, I alluded to it. I kind of, I kind of gave kind of a, a definition somewhat of what it is. And uh, I have to give credit to uh, Brother Gregory Allen. He's out of Alabama. He came up with this Gregory. term. Uh, so you know Greg? Yeah, from YouTube, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so he came up with this term, high-tech grace believers, and uh, I laughed so hard when I first heard it because, you know, it, Greg comes up with these slogans or sayings that just, they make me laugh almost to the point where I fall out of my chair because it's just like, wow, you know, I never even thought about that. And I guess you could say there's two definitions of a high-tech grace believer. We have one person who exemplifies this definition. He's in here right now. Mike, because you carry around your uh, little smartphone and you read the Bible, I guess you could be considered a high-tech grace believer. Uh, Preferably a Mac one. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to have to call you out, Mike, but you're one of those high-tech grace believers. So. Next time. Yeah. Anointing rubs in. I never thought myself high-tech, but that's that's good. Okay. There you go. driving a high-tech sports car, so uh, I mean, you're just high-tech all the way. So uh, Now, the other definition, and this is the one that is more in line with what these high-tech grace believers are, these are generally people, and I say general, who at one point or another, they ascribe to the simple gospel of Christ uh, from 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. And simply believing that as the gospel of Christ, you can be saved today. And it's, as Brother Steve mentioned, it's the simplicity in Christ that we have by simply believing something so simple as what God laid down for us to believe. Now, these people, at one point or another, believe that simple gospel. But as the years went by, as they learned more scripture, as they learned to rightly divide, they became puffed up with knowledge. And with this puffed up knowledge, they decided that the simple gospel wasn't good enough. They decided that you needed to know more to be saved. You needed to know the divisions between not only Paul's gospel, but also the gospels that other uh, people in the past had ascribed to. So I want to I want to make this real clear in our minds because sometimes it's hard to wrap our mind around it. <coughs> but that's part of the high tech believer? Right. Okay. Here, here's, I'm going to put this in real world terms today. Here's a $50 bill. Uh, yeah. Is that real? This is a real $50 bill. <laughs> and I brought this to give to somebody as a gift. Woohoo! Yeah. Look, look how <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, so who wants this gift? First one up here gets it. Really? Oh, it's a tackling. Oh, there you go. I'll take it. Yeah, you can see it through. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. No. Frugal. It's a condition. Yeah, I, I actually just became a high-tech grace believer myself. So before you get that gift of $50, I was going to just give it to you. Uh, you need to understand how that money was made. And you need to know the production process of that money before you get that free gift. So I have... The value is going down. The <laughs> like, okay, this is I have a seven-page document here that you're going to need to understand before you take that free gift. How do you like that? And you're going to get tested? So you're, you're going to need to know about the paper and ink process. You're going to need to know about how it was designed. Now, I'm just giving you, I'm just giving you the uh, subject matter, but you're going to need to know the details of each. You're going to need to know the offset printing operations. You're going to need to know the offset plates, the offset printing process, the printing operations, the engraving process, the sideography, the plate making, and I can go on and on and on. 
you're going to need to know that process before you accept that free gift. How do you like that? Hey, keep your $50. Too much work. And not only are you going to need to know the process for this $50 bill, you're going to need to know the differences between this $50 bill and this $10 bill. How do you like that? I'm Canadian. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's, it's hard for, for me, and I know it's hard for other people, to wrap their minds around what's going on here. But in the real world's terms, that's what's going on. These individuals say, here's a free gift. But you now have to know everything about that free gift before you accept it. And that's just simply not true. So what we're going to do is turn to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to start off in verse 1 of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And, you know, I just take things from the scripture as they're written to me. Amen. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have also received, and wherein you stand, by which you are also saved. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, God has given us plain English to understand. And the plain English here on this piece of paper says that this is the gospel. You this skipped the part, though, in there, didn't you? In verse 2, where it said, yep. Well, <clears throat> the gospel is that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again. Your gospel is not, I preach to, uh, if you keep in memory uh, what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. That's not a gospel for you to believe. That's just explaining the situation there. Right, man. I understand that. I so, just figured that it must have been what Paul was preaching. Uh, Paul preached, for I delivered unto you first of all, which that I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He preached that to them for over two years. So, so Paul tells us in plain English, that is the gospel that we need to believe today. Is there anybody that doubts that? So, that is... And this is what I think is so cool. You were talking about gifts today. And I'm going to be talking about the gift of God today, too. So I thought that was really cool, Steve, how you were talking about gifts. And, you know, it's it's really, you know, everything works together for, for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And I Friday morning, I sat down with a co-worker, and we went to IHOP and had some breakfast. And he... We talked about the gospel of Christ at work, but he doesn't seem to have that peace. He, he just, he's not sure uh, whether he has to do something to be good. Uh, he's not sure about you know, whether God's going to accept him. Uh, he, f he feels like he has to keep doing or being good after he's trusted to be saved. So I sat down with him and stayed right in Romans. Romans 3, 4, and 5. And I showed him about four or five times where it says simply believe what God has said and that's imputed into you for righteousness. And I showed him four or five times and the yeah but came up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we're not going to believe plain English, then I can't help you. Nobody can help you. You're opposing yourself. And if God says it once, that's good enough. If God says it's twice, that's even better. If God says it four or five times, that all you have to do is believe that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. If that's good enough for God, that's good enough for me. Amen. So individuals oppose themselves when they don't want to believe that. They say, no, it can't be that easy. Well, it can be that easy. And why is it that easy? Well, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be just covering verses that Brother Steve here covered earlier. We're going to uh, be looking at the gift of God. And as we look at the gift of God, and as was spoken earlier, when you get a gift for Christmas or your birthday, did you have to do anything for it? Did you have to pay for it? Uh, no. You got something wrapped up in nice, colorful paper. Somebody handed it to you, and you received it. Now, at some point, you may not want to receive that gift. If somebody hands you a gift, you do have the right to say, no, I don't want it. So you can receive the gift, or you cannot receive the gift. So in Ephesians chapter 2, let's look in verse 8. For he, uh, I'm sorry. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see that salvation is a gift of God. Now let's turn to the left, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. You guys must be high-tech in back there in the back. Yeah, Mike's already there with his high-tech gadget. <laughs> All right. Romans chapter 4, and we'll be in verse 24. <clears throat> but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So here we see that in verse 25, that we have offenses. We have offended God in one shape or another. At some point in our life, we have offended God. So Christ was delivered for our offenses, <coughs> and he was raised again for our justification. So when Christ was raised again the third day, he didn't have our offenses on him. Those offenses were taken care of. So by believing on Christ, we have justification because he was raised again for our justification. So in verse, uh, jump over to chapter 5, verse 15. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. So here we see an offense, and then we see a free gift. For if through the offense one many be dead, much more the grace of God uh, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. <clears throat> and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto just justification. So here we see God's free gift is the covering of many offenses unto justification. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So here we see that the gift is of righteousness. It's God's righteousness imputed unto us. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So, <clears throat> so here we see in verse 18, the righteousness of one by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So you all can be justified right now as we sit here by Christ's righteousness. If you believe that God raised him from the dead, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, if you believe that he rose again on the third day, God imputes Christ's righteousness to you simply by believing that. And it's a free gift. So... With it being a free gift, that means you can also reject that gift. You can say, no, I don't want that gift. So God does not force his gifts upon us. We have to receive it. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
he talks to them as brethren. He said they received it. So there was some people who didn't receive it. And we're going to look at that. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> turn, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just so we can look at this. And verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, so he's speaking to saved individuals. You're not going to find anybody called a brother who is not saved. So he says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So Paul preached to these people the gospel, the gospel of Christ he preached to them. What does it say next? Which also you have received. So Paul preached to these people the gospel of Christ, and they received it. Now, does it say, <clears throat> moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have fully understood everything in the scriptures? Nope. It says, <clears throat> or does it say this, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have also understood everything that's different about our gospel compared to the gospel that Peter and the eleven preached. Does it say that? No. Why do I bring this up? Well, you know, I was a kid once, and I love getting gifts for Christmas. Now, right now, my wife and I, Kristen, based upon scriptures and based upon the, the timing, and Brother Steve, you did a really good uh, message on when Jesus was really born, we, we don't celebrate Christmas right now because of the occult things, but that's not to say that you guys don't have the, the liberty to do that. Uh, that's not what this is, message is about. I mean, if you want to celebrate Christmas, that's between you and God. I'm just saying right now, for myself and my wife, we don't celebrate Christmas. But when I was a kid, I definitely celebrated Christmas. <laughs> okay. I mean, I... I was, it was weeks before Christmas, and I was sneaking around the house, yeah. going in my parents' closet, seeing if they'd gotten <laughs> anything. <laughs> so I was definitely all about Christmas. Now, when I was a kid, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I loved getting model cars. I thought that was so cool. Uh, I loved getting G.I. Joe's. G.I. Joe's, yeah. yeah. G.I. Joe's. <laughs> well, the thing about getting a model car is, especially the, the cooler model cars, is it's very difficult to put together. And if you're not experienced, you might break apart. And I did that many times. <laughs> I got a model car and I just went to work on it. And I wasn't old enough, I didn't have the full understanding to put that car together right. I put glue in the wrong places, I snapped off pieces. Here's what happened. I received that gift, the gift of the model car. Did I fully understand everything about that model car, how to put it together, uh, you know, how to paint it right? No, I received that gift though. I received it with all my heart. I was ready to receive that gift. Same thing for a kid who gets a bicycle as a kid. If a kid's three, four, five years old, is he gonna know how to ride that bicycle like a pro? Is he gonna be doing 360s in the air and flipping it all around? No. But, gosh darn it, he's going to receive that bike and be the happiest kid on the block. But he doesn't understand everything. He doesn't know how to ride it correctly. He doesn't know how to, you know, do a 10K race with it or whatever. But he receives the gift. So, the point I'm trying to make here is that we may not understand everything about scriptures. We may not understand rightly dividing the word of truth, but you sure can receive that gift of salvation right now. You don't have to understand it all. Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. You can receive that right now, and you don't have to understand everything that went into that to receive that just that simple gift. Let's talk, talk about the simplicity of Christ. So, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 17. Now, another thing that these high-tech race believers 
like to say is that people are not hearing the correct gospel of Christ. They're not getting the full information. And because of that, people aren't getting saved because they're not hearing the gospel of Christ. So I have to ask myself, is there anybody in scripture or is there anybody in time, is there anybody in history that would have preached the gospel of Christ more perfectly than the apostle Paul? So he, he preached the gospel of Christ just as God would want him to preach it better than anybody could today, probably. So let's look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphilius and Apollyana, they came unto Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So, right there in verse 3, we see Paul preaching the perfect gospel of Christ. Right? You can't preach it any better than the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, and took with them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on uproar. So here we see the Apostle Paul, who has been revealed the knowledge by Jesus Christ himself, with the perfect gospel of Christ. He is the chief of sinners. He is the perfect example for all believers everywhere. Here he is in verse 3, preaching the gospel of Christ. And what does it say? Verse 4, some of them believe. Verse 5, and some of them believe not. So my point with saying this is an individual can get up here and preach the perfect gospel of Christ. And there will be individuals who believe, and there will be individuals who believe not. Now, is that the fault of the preacher? Not preaching the true gospel of Christ? No. It's the fault of that person opposing themselves. So we know that the gospel of Christ is being preached out there. It's not just us here in this room hearing the gospel of Christ. There's other men out there in the world preaching the true gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins. And that he was buried. And that he rose again on the third day. And by simply believing in that, you can be saved. There's people out there who oppose themselves and will not believe that. Does that mean that the truth was not preached? No. The truth is being preached. But just because men, women, everyone out there doesn't believe it when they hear it, doesn't mean the truth is not being preached. What are the high-tech people saying the gospel is? <clears throat> if it's not that? They're saying... As, as I alluded to earlier, it's not just receiving this. You have to understand the process that made this. You have to understand all the production that went into this before you can receive this as a free gift. All the right division. Yeah. All the right division. You have to understand Peter's gospel fully. You have to understand Paul's uh, doctrine fully. You have to understand where they differ. You have to understand at what point uh, the gospel of the kingdom stopped being preached and what point the gospel of Christ started being preached. You have to know all these things. You have to know all the books and how they line up perfectly. You have to know all these things. And that's what becomes a high-tech grace believer because they get puffed up with all this knowledge and they take the gift away from people. The gift is simple. You can receive the gift without understanding all the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to Acts chapter 14. <coughs> and Acts chapter 14 will be in verse 1. 
And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. So here we see in verse 1, we see uh, this is Paul and Barnabas. They went into the synagogue, and so they spake. Now, is there anybody here who doubts that it doesn't say it verbatim here, but does anybody doubt that they didn't preach the gospel of Christ in the synagogue? Okay, they, they preached the gospel of Christ there in verse 1. So we see Jews and Greeks believe. Verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So here we see, we see another confirmation. Paul goes into the synagogue, preaches the gospel of Christ. There's individuals that believe, and there's individuals that don't believe. And it's not the fault of Paul. It's not the fault of any preacher. The, the correct gospel was preached here. He showed them from the scriptures, and yet still there was individuals that didn't believe. So my point with all this is, is showing you that there is at least two cases now, and you know everything should be established by two or three witnesses. The perfect gospel of Christ can be preached, and there's going to be people who believe and people who don't believe. So <clears throat> we talked about the gift of God. And let's turn back to Romans. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> now, in Romans chapter 4, we're going to start in uh, verse 20. And this is talking about Abraham. And it's in reference to us. It says, verse 20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. In other words, believe on God. Verse 25. Who is delivered for our offenses and raised again for a, justifi a justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So here we see a standing in verse 2 that corresponds to the standing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. So let's, let's turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> verse 1. Moreover, brethren... I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which you also receive, and wherein you stand. So here we see them standing in the gospel. Verse 2, by which you are also saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, for anybody who wants to make verse 2 an if statement as far as their salvation, you're stumbling over a little stone. The little stone that you're stumbling over is after the word saved. There's a comma there. The comma separates the fact that they're saved from the fact that they had to keep in memory uh, what he preached unto them unless they have believed in vain. Now, if for anybody who stumbles over this verse, all you have to do is read verses 12 through 17, <clears throat> and you'll know that it is a rhetorical statement. Because anybody who has believed the simple gospel of Christ. You are saved and you are sealed. There's nothing, uh, there's no if statement about it. <clears throat> so let's read verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
So here we see not necessarily that Paul is saying that he preached it, even though he did preach it, uh, because Paul left at this point. He's writing back to the Corinthians, so there's other individuals that are preaching that Christ rose from the dead. <clears throat> and there's some individuals there that say there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So we see where the vanity comes from in verse 2. <clears throat> now verse 14 is a if statement. If Christ be not risen. Well, is Christ risen or is he not risen? He is risen. So it's a rhetorical statement. <clears throat> if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. <clears throat> so Christ is risen. Their preaching is not vain. And it says, and your faith is also vain. Well, if Christ is risen and their preaching is not vain, well, their faith is not vain. Okay? Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not up. <clears throat> For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. It's a rhetorical statement. Christ was raised from the dead, and they're not in their sins. Those who have believed. He's talking to brethren. He's talking to saved people. <clears throat> so, if anybody stumbles over verse 2, just Keep in mind, put a little parentheses there, verse 12 through 17. How do you know that everybody in the crowd is saved there? Verse 1, more of a brethren. But I mean, like right now, how would you know that everybody in this crowd is saved, even though we're all here as brethren? Right. Well, I can't preach this verse wondering whether everybody here is saved or not. I'm reading the verse as Paul wrote it to the Corinthians. Paul was, had the Holy Ghost upon him and the Holy Ghost speaking through him. The Holy Ghost wrote this scripture. If the Holy Ghost said, brethren, then I can take that word and trust it with all my heart. This verse was written to save people there in Corinth. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, wherein you also received and wherein you stand, by which you are also saved. So here we see brethren in verse 1. Verse 2, he says they're saved. These are saved individuals that he's writing to. So what would be the purpose of verse 2? <clears throat> Why would he even put that in there? Well, apparently there was some saved individuals there who were seduced by seducing spirits or uh, maybe false brethren had come in. But it's explained in verse 12 through 17. I guess there could have been false brethren because obviously mm -hmm. among you, uh, I'll say some among you, so some of the same, there'd be no resurrection. <clears throat> Would they be saved if they're denying resurrection? If they believe that Christ rose, uh, if, if they believe that Christ died for their sins and rose again from the dead the third day, then they're saved. And if they come back later on and say he didn't rise from the dead, that, that's a work that's going to be burned up, but they're still saved. They were sealed at the moment they believed. So any one of you can say, I've trusted Jesus Christ for my salvation, and years later down the road, deny that. Mm -hmm. If you really trust it, the scripture's clear. God puts his Holy Spirit seal upon you, and you cannot lose your salvation regardless of what you do, regardless of what you say. The same is true about these individuals. I mean, in uh, the first part of Corinthians, he calls them a carnal bunch. So they were doing all kinds of things that were contrary to what God wanted them to be doing. They're still saved. And God is not going to call somebody a brethren or saved 
if they're not really brethren, if they're not really saved. <clears throat> now, as I said in verse 2, this causes people to stumble over that comma. Let's look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Semi, uh, <clears throat> semicolon. And that he was buried, comma, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So in verse 4 we see that he was buried, comma. Is the fact that he was buried different from the fact he rose again on the third day? Are those two the same thing? Brian, are they the same thing? The fact that he was buried, is being buried the same thing as rising again the third day? Well, being put in the ground or in a cave is different from somebody coming out of the cave. Right. Notice there's a comma there. The comma separating two different thoughts. The same comma is there in verse 2. It's separating the fact that they're saved from the fact that there's some vain believers after they're saved. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is don't, don't neglect that comma there. Every single jot and tittle in the scriptures is there for a reason. It's there for our uh, learning. It's there for our salvation. So I guess what I want to do is just end, end here and just say that God has given us a free gift. God has given us a simple gift. The gift of salvation. You may not understand every aspect of it. You may not understand how God worked everything within that gift. But you can be as a kid on Christmas Day. God's handing you this gift. And you can receive it just as you would receive a gift from a, as, as a kid. You didn't understand everything about the science set you received, the chemistry set as a kid. But you sure did receive it. And you are happy to receive it. So you can be happy with the gift God's given you today. It's simple. God's offering it to you. And you have the ability to receive it or you have the ability to uh, reject it. So the choice is up to you. Don't oppose yourself. And don't oppose the gift that God's given you. And with that, that's all I had today. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.